Hi, welcome. Digital disruption, how the art world is evolving. My name is Alfred Ed Zuri. I'm a curator and art advisor and I come from traditional art and so does every single person on this stage and we are so excited to talk to you today. I'm gonna start by allowing each of our humans to introduce themselves and say something about their place in the traditional art world. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Bong Lee. I'm with uh, Soul Auction and Soul Auction Blue. Uh, we're in the traditional art auction business, art finance, warehousing, uh, retail shops, uh, art fractional ownership, uh, NFT, uh, etc. So, so we're in pretty much uh, in, in most of the stuff that whatever you can do with art. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bong. Thanks. <laughs> I'm Vladislav Ginsberg, Vlad for short, uh, founder and CEO of Block Party. I've been involved with NFTs since 2017. And prior to that, I spent 10 years as an art dealer and I managed an art fund that invested in blue chip artworks. Hi there. Uh, my name is Walker Waugh. Uh, I'm the studio director for Dustin Yellen, a contemporary artist in New York who also started and runs a cultural center called Pioneer Works in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I also come from the traditional art world, uh, worked in galleries, started galleries, private dealer, and now work with an artist that kind of operates uh, like a gallery. So excited to chat with everybody. Perfect timing. Here is my fifth and maybe favorite panelist. Nice to see you guys. Welcome. We are just introducing ourselves. All right, I would like to have a sip of water. I'm yeah. Hello, hi everyone. Uh, we're introducing ourselves, yeah? That's it, super easy. Okay, cool. Uh, hi everyone, my name's Kirsten. I'm uh, currently the head of research and acquisition at the art foundation called K11, based in Hong Kong. Um, I come from a traditional art historical background. So I guess I'm here to be challenged and I look forward to that. So, for the last 13 years, I've been advising, dealing, and curating traditional art. And two and a half years ago, a certain Matt Medved approached me and said, he'd like me to come on as an advisor for this thing that hadn't even been created yet called NFT Now. And I said, I don't think so. I don't know anything about NFTs. <laughs> and what Matt sold me on, of course, was the promise for creators, the promise for artists. And that promise was being able to give ownership, digital ownership, not only to artists and creators, but also to collectors. And once I learned more about it, I fell down the rabbit hole. So by the time I was asked for my bio and my uh, headshot for our deck, I was in deep. And fast forward today, where I have curated traditional museum shows. I curated the first NFT show in the World Trade Center, all women, of course. I've curated an NFT show with Block Party, for Christie's NFT Now activation for our very first gateway. And so I'd love for you to talk to me about your experiences in the digital art space. Absolutely. What brought me here was seeing digital artists experimenting with NFTs. I entered the NFT space in 2017 thinking about NFTs and digital assets, concert tickets, and all these things that we own digitally. But I didn't get excited about it. I didn't get really truly passionate about NFTs until I saw digital artists thinking about NFTs as a medium and thinking about digital ownership and what it means. So there are art forms, there are, there, there's, uh, there's mediums like photography that have become digitally native and are kind of half digital and half analog and seeing the way that uh, photographers are able to retain their work in a naturally digital format and never need to become printmakers and use NFT has been fascinating. Um, having the experience of building a minting platform, the biggest eye opener was watching digital artists, watching artists that are legacy, physical artists, adapt to digital, how they, you know, how they mint, how they create, how they sell, what works, what doesn't work. Back in 2019, we had no idea how artists would use blockchains. Would artists use mainnet for one of ones and uh, layer twos for additions? Uh, would artists use different layer ones as different like community portals? We just didn't know. And it's been a lot of experimentation and a lot of, you know, 
learn, revise, try again, learn, revise, try again. Uh, that's been my experience. How about you guys? Yeah, I mean, I, my uh, background previously, I, I did work with a, a photography gallery and, and it was very interesting because there was a moment in, in the art world where photography was not really considered uh, on the same level as, as some of the other you know, uh, art forms. And then, and then it did have its moment. And, 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 uh, and I think this moment where, uh, there's a digital ownership piece to, uh, the kind of images that are ubiquitous, uh, is so important for ownership, you know, reclamation for, for some of these artists, but that's just, a you know, a, a, a tangent to what I really want to talk about, which is, you know, the artist that I work with is a traditional artist. We, aren't really a digital artist. We, we make large scale glass sculpture mostly. Uh, we just opened a show actually with Afrodet here in, uh, in Seoul uh, on Monday. Um, and, and it's uh, a group of paintings and, and one large glass sculpture and, and one animation, but. Um, the animation that you can see it in our lobby here. Oh yeah. The, it's the, Dustin Yellen. Yeah, so, so you know, Dustin's um, foray into uh, the digital space uh, has been incremental. And I think that that's important for us, uh, you know, as, as an artist that uh, is much more uh, object-based. Um, the, the challenge, and we were talking about this the other night, is, is how do we uh, marry uh, uh, some of our digital explorations back to uh, the physical uh, sculptures that we make or the paintings that we make? And I think that that's an interesting not problem, but obstacle, I think, that, that uh, is still not quite yet solved. Um, you know, do you want to marry, uh, you know, digital artwork to its, uh, its object or are they two separate things? Is it important to the artist? Every artist is going to have a different answer. Um, there are physical, uh, things like chips and, 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 uh, you know, uh, other tags that can be applied, but, uh, we're more interested in, in kind of the emerging technologies that are happening now where we can, you know, evolve, uh, metadata of, of, of digital pieces and, and potentially embed things into our, our, uh, you know, our, our sculptures. Um, but the challenge for us is, is how do you, uh, you know, continue to uh, explore with a practice that is not necessarily um, native to this space. Um, and you know, there's not an easy answer, but it's, it's, a, it's a question worth trying to answer. And uh, you know, for, for Dustin and, and myself, uh, you know, one of the other uh, you know, important pieces of, of all of, of, of this is um, you know, expanding our collector base. So that's, that's part of the reason that we've come to Korea. Uh, we see that there's this incredible enthusiasm for art and culture right now in this moment. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a time for exploration and it's a time for uh, us to introduce ourselves to, to new markets and to new ideas. And, and we want to learn uh, from what's happening here and what works here uh, and, and then apply it to, you know, the work that we're making uh, back in our studio in New York. So I think it's interesting that you know, we're, we're all here in Korea right now, right? And it's because the word NFT hasn't become dirty here yet, right? In the States, we're already starting to say digital collectibles. We've been doing that for a long time. I curated a digital art show in December, not an NFT show. They just happen to be NFTs. Um, how have you seen the advent of digital art in Korea? Like, how do you see it disrupting the traditional art space? Because I look around this week and there have been so many digital art shows, so many NFT shows. Yeah, so it's interesting that you mentioned photographs because, you know, 20 years ago when we, when we uh, had a photograph exhibition with uh, you know, Struth, Gursky, Agar yeah. Esther, you know, people are confused and asking, you know, well, how is this, this, uh, this an artwork? But, you know, it took, us that, it took us around like three to five years mm -hmm. to understand that it is a form of artwork. So the moment that we, 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 got, it, we got our hands on the, the, the digital art, it was a little bit different because we, we, we didn't produce the photography, right? We, we just brought the photography artwork from overseas to Korea and to try to convince and try to explain to the collectors here. But with digital work, we had to work with artists first and then have them understand, you know, what, what the capabilities and what, what, to what extent that they can actually expand their expression and their mind using the technology. And especially with the advancement of uh, AI, you know, we, everybody trying to keep up, you know, what, what you can do definitely uh, and how you can apply it. Um, 
so at the end, you know, what we realize is that digital art is just another form of art, right? It's just another medium. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a new way of expression, you know. But the video art has been around for a very, very long time. Uh, the performance art has been around for a very, very long time. So if, if you get into, you know, we, we start hating the word NFT art, right? So we, we, we start saying digital. Um, so when we get to that point, uh, you, you start thinking about, okay, when you express your statement or your, your point of view as an artist, you can use whatever technology or whatever things you can do, or even, you know, the famous artists now, they don't even do it themselves, right? So it doesn't really matter. So what, what you end up doing is what, what really happened with the digital, digital world that came on us is that the, the world itself, for the, the paradigm for the art business changing is what we, we understand. It, it used to be us going to the artist studio, talking with them, you know, bringing in their artwork, introducing them to museums and collectors, but now they don't really need us, right? Yeah, they can just do it themselves. Right? They can connect directly with the museums, with the community, and the support that they get is not from the collectors nor the gallery. The support that they get from now with this digital aspect is that it's gonna be a fully community-driven uh, market, whether we like it or not. So we haven't gotten there as a traditional art, uh, you know, a gallerist or auction house, but it's definitely hitting there, and we're, you know, we're trying to prepare uh, for that as much as we can. Yeah. It, it's funny that photography keeps coming up. I remember being in graduate school and being forced to study photography, and I had to write a thesis paper on it. And I basically text messaged my professor and said, I don't get it. I can take photos with my phone. And uh, he's like, that's because you don't understand it. And he challenged me to really understand photography the same way Matt Medved challenged me to understand NFTs. And um, I'm curious, so, so Kirsten here uh, runs the K-11 Foundation in Hong Kong. And what I'm really curious about is how is Hong Kong approaching digital art in comparison to Korea? That's an interesting question. Um, I remember during COVID, the first year of COVID, um, there was a digital art fair. And I don't really think it had anything or everything to do with NFTs. It's just a bunch of digital art and then kind of like vaguely falling in the realm of such term. But then two years later, you're because we're seeing more and more and more of that. As a matter of fact, the third year of that digital art fair is going to take place inside our, our compound. So we're quite excited to say it. Uh, we're quite excited about it. And I suppose that will be the time when I start learning the technical terms of NFT. <laughs> no, it's a joke. But it's funny that uh, everybody was talking about photography. I love photography. Um, and fun fact, um, just 20th century, so not so far ago, like the idea of image, the theory was newly established, fully, uh, gradually developed and then um, into appropriation, etc. stuff like that. So I think it's just a natural sort of a progressive curve that we are embracing this. But my personal question for all of you, and then the personal question that I've been having for a very long time is that personal connection that Bong was talking about. Um, so the, the nature of NFT, how does it connect other than visual and hearing? I, I would just say, um, you know, one of the things that the art world um, uh, has kind of been very careful about establishing for itself is this idea of opacity and uh, exclusivity. And, and uh, you know, a, a very small number of galleries and museums and individuals that are responsible for driving markets. And I think one of the great uh, kind of revelations of blockchain is transparency and this idea that uh, ownership um, it can be can be seen, can be tracked. That that prices can be seen, can be tracked. Uh, I think it's something that is scary for a lot of people in the art world. But you'll, see, as you see, you know, this is this event sponsored by Christie's. There are a lot of 
organizations in the traditional art world that realize that they need to adapt or die and 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 they need to evolve to the um you know new landscape i think you know the title of this panel is digital disruption i think all great art in its time was derided or or chided you know like i was at the fair earlier and saw at the gogosian booth the uh, namjoon pak uh tv buddha which was uh you know i think made in 1962 uh was the first year that he started making those and at the time it was like what is this you know but uh uh, th this idea of, of, of the digital and of these kind of, uh, you know, uh, things that, that disrupt the, the status quo uh, are, are hard to swallow, but there are certainly outliers and maybe everyone in this room is, you know, occupies that space. Uh, so it's, it's important to know that, that uh, something that you've done that is not necessarily accepted uh, doesn't mean that it's not the right thing or an evolution of, of a system that needs uh, changes. To expand upon what Walker was saying and why I got excited about NFTs in the first place was it suddenly allowed these artists to have access to their collectors. I can easily open up the blockchain and see all the wallets that own this, all the wallets that have collected this. And suddenly I'm not beholden to a museum or a gallery to have access to my people. And, and that in itself is really special to not have to pay 50% to a gallery and commission as an artist for an artist to truly own what they're working on. And up until recently with this whole open sea debacle, it also meant royalties because unfortunately when an artist sells a work and it gets resold, they do not get a commission off that resale. So people are profiting off of them every single day without them sharing in the profits and NFTs and the blockchain and smart contracts al allowed the profit sharing. So I think about digital disruption uh, in three minds. And before NFTs even became a thing, I go back to my time starting an investment fund for fine art. Now, starting an investment fund for fine art in 2008, where you have a fiduciary responsibility to your LPs and you're managing their money and you're putting it into things like art, it is uncomfortable because in the business of investment funds, you have to offer a lot of price transparency. You have to offer a lot of price discovery. And that just wasn't as available in 2008. And something we take for granted today in the art world, which is Artnet, which is a basic searchable database of auction results, that's still, even though that's taken for granted today, that was still like a relatively newer thing in 2008. And even then, Auction, public auction accounts for maybe a third of the global art trade. So price discovery in art is murky. Uh, it talks to opacity, like you mentioned. And now fast forward to digital art with NFTs, you have total price discovery. You have, you have radical price discovery. That's disruption. And I think I was, it was last night, I was speaking with Nicole, that's who, who was up on stage earlier, about their auction of Keith Haring and how they did uh, Andy Warhol auctions two years ago. And these are artists that we don't associate with digital art, but they were making digital art in the 1970s. Now, before NFTs, it would be very hard for a private dealer to sell Andy Warhol's digital art. It would be very hard to sell Keith Haring's digital art. NFTs have given us art dealers, us galleries, us auction houses, the ability to put digital art in a frame, so to speak, and sell it. So that's the second mind, how it's impacted the digital art trade. And then in the third mind, as a builder of things in the NFT space, there is something also very radical and very exciting about the idea that just here at the gateway, you can walk through these exhibition halls and see a lot of wonderful digital art and a lot of wonderful digital art that has been minted as NFTs. But I would venture to say none of the digital art on these walls is in the same physical location as the token. The token is in somebody's wallet. And that hardware wallet may be somewhere back in the United States, somewhere globally. I see a lot of art here that was minted somewhere else, that the NFT is in a hardware wallet somewhere else. And we've disambiguated the need for art to physically be where it's exhibited. Now, does that 
maybe borrow and take away from scarcity a little bit, sure. But I think it also, we talk a lot about democratizing art and what does that really mean? And are we democratizing art when things still cost millions of dollars when we sell digital art? But there is something exciting about a newer world where exclusivity and rarity doesn't mean you can't possibly see this art unless you're in a museum in the one year that it's in a retrospective. Otherwise, it's in Switzerland at a Freeport. Uh, we're in a kind of a new world where art is abundant. Art is everywhere while maintaining the opportunity for ownership to be scarce. Ong, I'd love you to expand upon the accessibility that we're leaning into right now, if you're comfortable. The accessibility of digital art. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I completely agree, uh, you know, with everything that you said. Um, but the, the the way I look at it is, um, you know, we, we we started we used to sell sneakers a lot here, you know, when StockX was up, and then we, we start getting all these like crazy, you know, boxes of boxes of sneakers sent to our office. We didn't think people would trade that much. Uh, but what happened after a year was that they, they didn't want the sneaker back, right? They want us to keep it and then they want to send it when they sell the sneakers, right? So they wanted us to become the warehouse of their, their trade and their collection. But the, the, the same thing is happening with the, with the fine art as well. So we, we, have, um, we have three buildings uh, uh, locally and a little bit in the suburbs holding uh, artwork for our companies as well as our clients. So we, we have a warehouse uh, program. So after uh, post COVID, there was so much demand that we had to build another building uh, twice as big uh, to hold uh, these artwork, right? So even with the traditional side, accessibility, is it really important? Is, is, uh, having the, is the need to have it, the physical uh, item in front of your face or in your house, is that necessary? You know, it's, it's already fading. You know, we're, we're moving on to the next phase where we're not so obsessed about uh, physical uh, aspect of that collection or the expression that the artist is providing. So when you get to digital side, um, you know, w when we look at digital side, we, we started NFTs as well, but what we realize uh, these days is that it's, it's, not, it's not about gamification. It's not about your utility function. You know, we don't care about you burning your physical art to, to get the token side or the ownership. So if you talk to the art artists, even in Korea, you know, they, everybody takes the blockchain as differently. Maybe somebody, somebody might use it, integrate it into their artwork. Some people just don't give a shit. Some people say, okay, it's a form of authentication, but I don't even know how it works. So I don't even know how to use that as an authentication. And if some people from Dubai say, you know, they have the best technology, these artists are very dubious. Is that I don't want to do anything with Dubai. I don't care who it is, right? So accessibility, yeah, you know, it's good, but it's just a sense of ownership, whether you use the, uh, you know, the, the NFTs or just the artist just giving you a certificate and saying that, okay, it's, it's in my warehouse, my, this is my studio, but you own it. Or you can come to people like us where we, we operate warehouses and we're going to give you a receipt and that also proves that, that you own the artwork, right? And if you give that slip to someone else, we will we'll happily gladly give it to you that new person, right? But in order to move this a little faster, we can't just you keep on using slips. So we gotta use the technology to make it go faster and more efficient. And then, and then if, you do, if you do fractional, then it becomes even more in interesting because now you're owning the artwork with a bunch of people. And because, let's say, you know, if you wanna support uh, people, although I'm, I'm sure he doesn't need my support, but you know, but if somebody wants to be part of it, right, then you can fractionalize it. And in Korea right now, it's probably um, uh, one of the fastest growing uh, countries for uh, securitized uh, tokens uh, right now. So accessibility, uh, definitely important. But I, I think collecting any form of art is, is not about, uh, not too much about the, the, the uh, physical aspect of stuff is actually about, it's very personal. And it, now it's becoming more, not, it's not only between you, gallerist, and the collector, it's now becoming um, artist and not me, but the rest of the community. So those two components are the most important thing. And as long as you 
feel comfortable or somebody gives you another way of confirming that that you're part of it, it is is good enough so they don't need to nobody needs to you know hang hang that uh digital art anywhere to be specific i love that take i had a completely different meaning of accessibility but i loved yours what what i was referencing is so the art world super opaque very wealthy um the majority of art is being held in Swiss ports that people will never see. And what's really special about digital art is you don't necessarily need to come to a gallery to see digital art. You can just turn on your computer. I used to open my portfolio constantly on Open Siege to see my art and I loved it. And when people started making screens, there's so many screens now and they're beautiful. And I thought I'm not covering my home in screens. I just open my laptop and I can see so much digital art. And that's one of the biggest differences. And Kirsten, I'd love for you to touch upon, like from a traditional art space, like what it means to be, to be accessible. Well, I've been, um, I started my first job at Christie's and now I've been a buyer for a very long time. So I've been always dealing with the traditional art market for about nine years um, by now. And I totally, concur. I understand the concept, the systematic nature of NFT. But what we are talking about, I personally love the idea. Don't take me wrong, I really love it. But the thing that I was uh, referring to earlier was traditional space and art. The term itself, like how do we define that? If we can bridge our worlds on that definition of art, then we have a future. Because for me, I still remember, I'm still in this industry because say if I stand in front of a piece of art, I would like to cry. There are times, there are many, many times in my life that I would like to cry. For example, um, the beautiful later Monet at the MoMA, that I cried. So um, I would like to know if that's a possibility with NFT as well. I mean, I, this is an incredible point I, I, that, that I also, I share this, um, uh, this feeling that in many ways, there's no replacing the, the, the physical um, experience of art. Um, and, and, you know, you, you have a physical space that, that you work within. In, in New York at Pioneer Works, uh, we've built, um, a, a, you know, a large scale cultural center that supports a lot of young artists working across many, many disciplines uh, through residencies and exhibitions and, um, and lectures and concerts uh, at this confluence of art and science and technology. And I think it's so important to have these places where people can go to still experience the making of art and the exhibition of art and the dialogues around art and all of the conversations that come from people working in different disciplines coming together, I think it's 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 critical to maintain those those spaces um, because you know Pioneer Works, for example, we have you know technology res residents that that are showing work that is digital by nature, but also sculptural. Um, folks that make, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, digital environments. We just, we did a big show with the artist Jacoby Satterwhite uh, a few years ago, who I think is at the, the, the cutting edge of uh, someone that's making immersive environments, but also very tactile, sculptural uh, uh, installations, performance, and all of these things together make his his, his practice and you can't extract one from, from, from the practice because it will be incomplete. And so I, I don't think that there's this replacement uh, of, of the digital for the traditional. I think what we all are kind of interested in, uh, at least I am, is, is this overlap and confluence and, and growth that can occur when we, we, we bring these technologies together. Um, I think NFTs are, or blockchain technology is, is just that. It's a technology that is a foundation underneath a lot of what these, these artists are, are making. And I think that adoption 
of uh, the, the technology as a provenance or as a, as a certificate of authenticity. I think that is the best and most expansive use case. Um, but I, I, I agree with you that there's no separating that experience. I had, I had this experience when I saw this Nam June Pike TV Buddha. I had seen them in, in, uh, in a documentary about, about the artist. And, but then I was standing in front of this piece and I saw his signature on the, on the back of the Buddha and it was a, a, a spiritual moment for me. And I don't want to replace that. I want to find a way to keep that and then apply that to, uh, you know, the, the future where this technology can be more ubiquitous and, and, and you know, the, the, the world can come around to it and not think of NFT as, as somebody like, you know, rugging me or, you know, stealing my, my bags. <laughs> Just to underline, provenance is, is the history of a, of a piece of art. It's, you know, when it was created, where it was created, and then all the hands of ownership that it passed through. And so whenever you're buying a work, the example I have to give is this. Warhol made a uh, hundred cows in four different colors, right? And if I had a cow, and let's say Steve Wynn had a cow, Steve Wynn's cow, even though it's the exact same as mine, is more valuable because of that provenance. He's a very, very important collector. And what's really beautiful about the blockchain, of course, is it registers every single owner. I can look at every work that I own. I can look at every work that's on the online and I can see all the hands that it passed through. And that makes it really interesting. And I know Vlad's going to have something really great to expand upon this. Thank you, Afrodat. Uh, I'm going to actually take the challenge of your question, Kristen, and stick on the subject of disruption and what we're doing here at the Gateway. And, um, and yes, uh, is the short answer. I think there is an opportunity for digital art to have that kind of emotion. I'm gonna point to a couple of artists that are on display again here at this exhibit. Um, first of all, and before I do that, I think there's a struggle and I think there's a process that everybody from Trad Art goes through to try to make all this blockchain stuff feel real, feel tactile, feel uh, less ephemeral and more like in actuality. And so I think as traditional art people, we very quickly hook on to things like COA, things like, wait, this, uh, this tracking is a way to understand authenticity for digital art. It's a way to understand collectability. But I always caution folks to remember this technology is blockchains wallets that are connected to the blockchain and tokens that can go in and out. So yes, that can be a collecting tool. Yes, that can be a provenance tracker, but some artists are using that as a medium in and of itself. So I'm gonna call attention to Sam Spratt, who has a work here uh, that references his Skull of Lucy. And he made a one of one work, the monument game, and he invited everybody to have an experience with his, uh, with his artwork, see how it makes them feel and invited them to write anything about their experience with it. Really, and, and the reward for doing so was some entries would be chosen to get a piece of his art. And now you're blending in art lovers as well as speculators that want a piece of art for, uh, for a little bit of money that actually costs a lot of money uh, on secondary. And they didn't just submit their poems or they didn't just submit their writings. They submitted something on chain. And so now there's this interplay of ownership between the, the artists that made a one of one and viewers of the art that actually have a token and share their experience with the art. Uh, there's another artist here that is being shown and also in the crowd, Dave Krugman, who did a project called Drive and invites his collectors and non-collectors to submit their own interpretations of Drive. And the, uh, the radical disruption here is not just thinking about the technology as a way to do, perform a certain task, but also share with, with the collector community, with the art lover community, uh, like some interplay of energy, some interplay of what experiencing art is. And having read all of Sam Spratt's um, 
entries of, of, uh, of the people that played the monument game, people had real emotional, visceral reactions to his work uh, to a very personal level. And to see that as an art lover, to, that it, I think it answers your question. At, le at least one example we can point to where people are having this visceral reaction to art, and that's what you're hoping to see. So Rafiq Anadol is a really good example of when a, a work that you have to stand in front of and experience. Rafiq is difficult to see on a little screen, right? We have a, a series of his works here as well as one in the Shiloh right now. And I feel chills when I stand in front of Rafiq's work. I feel chills when I stand in front of a lot of this work. But what I was discussing before is the accessibility of, we are very privileged. Either we drove here, we taxied here, we flew here, and not everyone has that privilege. And whenever I think about curating, I think about accessibility and I think about being able to share whatever these, the artists that I love and that I care about with as many people as possible. And that means, you know, having a website for these artists, Instagramming them, tweeting them, whatever, so everyone can see the work. But yeah, nothing replaces standing in front of an art piece, whether it's digital or physical, and having that connection, having that emotion to it. I mean, look at this. Um, Walker. Well, well oh. you would ask me a question? Yeah, but you can, you can. No, I just, I, I, um, uh, I wanted to echo what Vlad was saying about um, Sam's project in particular being a, a, an incredible use case for uh, the technology. Dave's work as well. Um, I, I live in a neighborhood in New York where Dave took some of his photographs and I kept sending Dave photogra my photographs of the cars that he had already taken photographs of. Um, uh, uh, just like, oh, look, I'm, I'm, this is this like dialogue that we're in here. Um, but I, 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 I have to also, uh, you know, plug the, the work that, that uh, the artists that I'm working with, Dustin uh, Yellen, you know, who comes from this very kind of object-based, uh, 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 you know, background. Uh, and if you ever meet Dustin, you'll, you'll see he's usually carrying around a rock in his pocket that came from Mars um, that, that, you know, we've, we've, you know, determined through science that has these kind of, uh, uh, you know, isotopes that, that, you know, are, are similar to the, the building blocks of, of, of our world. And, and, and so, you know, someone that's deeply interested in deep time and, and, and uh, uh, not the kind of like, you know, short term thinking of, uh, you know, the last hundred years of uh, technological advances. But the, the project that we're working on right now, also with Nifty Gateway, um, uh, which is what Sam launched his incredible project on, uh, and they built this wonderful interactive site which if you don't know or haven't seen this monument game, I think is, is a great example of uh, uh, moving the space forward in, in, sub, in substantive ways. Uh, the, the work that we're building is, uh, is hopefully um, as inspired and is also interested in that, that dialogue with the, with the collector and the community and, and uh, allowing people to uh, hold these uh, pieces of digital art that uh, could potentially evolve or change uh, during the course of your ownership of, of them and uh, rewarding collectors for holding the, the artwork rather than flipping the artwork. And uh, I think that's, a, that's another piece of this whole conversation, this kind of idea of speculation versus collecting versus why are you, in, why are you interested in NFTs? Why are you interested in, in digital art? Uh, and I think uh, ultimately um, this space will uh, mature in a way that uh, uh, I, I think uh, will allow for more people to, to have access. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we're very interested in our studio in accessibility and, and, and education. Um, so this idea of uh, reaching a larger audience um, doing something that is disruptive to the technology that exists uh, whilst uh, uh, staying true to an artistic vision. I think this is the kind of the triumvirate of, uh, you know, success for uh, an artistic practice. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it, it's something that I think culture uh, is the glue that, that binds all of us together. And I think we can all agree on that, um, that, uh, we have a lot of differences uh, politically or, uh, you know, in, in a lot of different uh, capacities, but I think culture is the thing that will drive uh, all of us forward. Um, and, you know, and, and art that 
um, is challenging, uh, it is, is important, even if it's not accepted in this moment, um, it needs to be made uh, for future generations to look back and say, okay, I can I can take risks and, and do different things. I love that you're doing future talk because I'd like to open it up and ask, where do you see the future of the space going? Well, I'll plug my thing. Um, so the future of the space, um, I'm thinking about the trade of art. So I mentioned earlier, one of the most disruptive things about digital art and NFTs is radical price discovery, which is, again, does just does not exist in the art market. Uh, it is, there's no legitimate way to sell digital art as an NFT. It doesn't matter if it's auction, private sale, whatever. There's no legitimate way to sell art uh, in the NFT world that is not on chain and doesn't show up transparently um, in the art world. So uh, what does that mean for art dealers? What does that mean for artists? What does that mean for the art market? Um, and coming from the art dealer side previously, that's the stuff that I'm interested in and that's the stuff that we're building for at Block Party. And what does that mean for the economy of trading art when there is radical price discovery? I think a lot of the times as art people, we decry the over-financialization of art. But uh, again, referencing what I said earlier, when you can only offer very limited price discovery, it's very hard to operate an investment fund. Uh, and that's a financial business at its core. And now we live in a new world now where you really can operate a financial institution and investment fund for fine art, because if it's NFT focused, you have this wonderful price discovery. This is disruptive, this is radical, and I just can't wait to see what happens next. I have an opinion on what happens next, but I'll save that. Uh, in terms of the artists themselves, um, I just wanna see more artists go in the direction that somebody like Sam is spearheading which is thinking less about blockchain, smart contracts, tokens, wallets, as infrastructure level things that you, or like tech words, that this is how it works, and more of like tools in the studio. How can I use smart contracts? How can I use tokens? How can I use wallets to create more diverse and interesting art? It's not, maybe it's more than, um, maybe it's more than a digital painting. Maybe it is an interplay. Maybe it is a creative use of wallets and tokens. Uh, I think a lot of artists are thinking about this stuff the right way. A lot of artists are studying generative art and adapting their work to that. Um, I'm looking at you. <laughs> and uh, that's what I want to see more of. Let's, let's use these things as tools to create more art as opposed to this is just how the technology works. Bangor Kirsten, do you have anything you'd like to add about the future of the space? Yeah, so the the way I look at it is, you know, you, you can't tell you can't tell Claude Monet to paint like Basquiat, right? Complete different generation, complete different years. It's not going to work, right? So two years ago, when when we called up our group of artists and like, hey, we're going to get into NFTs, and uh, we want you to create something uh, with or without our team, uh, that something that we can display in art, right? and just forget about all the utility functions. So we had a really hard time. One of the artists actually asked me to buy him an Oculus, so I, I bought him one. And then he's been playing with it for months. And then one, you know, out of one day, he showed up with like a completely sh bloodshot eye. I said, hey, what's wrong? And he said, hey, you know, I, I've, been, I've been using the Oculus thing, and so I got a hang of it. So every day for 12 hours, I've been using it to create artwork, right? So it, it came out okay. Um, uh, but is it is it compared to people who actually started their career uh, professionally or you know unofficially in a digital uh, aspect? Is that as good as that? Is that good as Unreal Five or anywhere around there? Unreal Five plus AI is it really close to that? No, it's absolutely not. You know, it's not going to work out, right? So my point is, there's always you know you know postmodern. Um, impressionist market, contemporary market, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to exist, right? But there's a new wave of uh, collectors, new way of um, artists. And, you know, Monet is never going to paint like Basquiat. You know, you, you know Basquiat, he, he's never going to paint like 
people, right? Uh, and you know, and they're never, and, you know, these the traditional artists. If we tell them, hey, I'm going to show you an artwork by uh, Mac Doug Jones, you know, why don't we why don't you add some blockchain on it and do all this cool stuff and blah blah, blah and do this? They're like, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. So it's a completely new wave that's coming. So yeah, it, there's it's it's going to get bigger because there's a new market that's to, uh, about to be exposed and kind of going back to what you know christian says am i if i look at it you know am i going to be moved am i going to be emotionally um reacting to it i i think i mean this is just my 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 assumption but look you know digital art you know we've we experienced it through Bill Viola, right? Those are beautiful water paintings. Uh, and you know, some of other, you know, Namjoon Pike is very different because it was a, it was a video sculpture itself. But videos, it, it's, it's been around, you know, you, you go to um, uh, digital towers, right? And then they have all these really cool looking uh, visuals. And some of them actually just turn into um, artists because now, now you're allowed to say you're an artist because of all this hype. Um, but the reason why you can't, sometimes you can't feel that emotion, I think, is because our technology is cu uh, catching up, right? So if you're looking at like even some artworks here, you're like, oh, you know, I, maybe I can do that. Maybe I can pay someone to do it, right? Right, you definitely you can. But what, you know, what's the point? How do, you, how do you get immersive with it? Is that you need to, we need to move on to the next uh, you know, three to five years where we can have goggles and we can enter into VR like straight away and come back to AR, go to MR, et cetera. So that, ha that world has happened. Once that happens, then you'll be moved. What, then you'll be immersed and sometimes you will never click out of it. Because I, I don't know if you use uh, just the, even the first version of Oculus, it's amazing. You, you know, you turn it on, I, I bought it. Well, the, I, I was on it for six hours because I was so amazed. I, I bought like 10, 20 games, whatever there was, trying everything out. But digital art, the reason, if you're not moved by digital art, the reason is because we were so used to it 20, 30 years ago, whatever you see, but the only way to do it is to get immersive into it. In order to do that, then you, the technology has to catch up. So what can we do before the technology catches up? Our assumption is it's all about experience. It doesn't matter what the medium is. Medium is, I keep on telling you, medium is not important at all. You know, Damien Hirst has, an, I, I'm sure Damien Hirst, Jeff Koons, you know, these guys, they, ha they, haven't, they haven't picked up a paint for a really long time. You know, they have a staff of 100 people, et cetera, right? They're, they're, they're giving ideas, and, but they're the one who's spearheading how to express and how, how to get to the collector. So in order to do that, let's say, you know, in the morning I was talking back to Jones, right? So I was like, yeah, I, I love your replicator project. Uh, you know, I, I, I want to talk to you because I want to set up a gallery and re remake that replicator room and then I want my collectors come and press the button on the printer and sometimes it might get jammed but if it does come out then I want a signed version of your original art so people can take it away with them right then you, you start to interact you start to interact and get immersive with the artist's intention because you're already in that room that he, he intended of course, once the technology catches up, then we don't have to do that, right? But it hasn't. So the only way to get this digital artist to, to be uh, understood as a fine art traditional artist is have them to really get submersive uh, in a 2.0 level, uh, if, if that's the, the, the most we can do. Yeah. Thank you, Bonk. I want to say thank you for my panelists for being here. And also, if you want to feel moved, please, please experience the central room designed by one of my favorite artists, Nostalgic, and you will feel something. Thank you so much for being here.